there's an old saying that when you learn something, when you learn something about any field or you know, you, as you get older, what you really learn is how little you know. And I feel kind of strange being up here with these guys because they're really record producers. I've produced exactly three CDs. Um, the third one uh, you'll hear later in the show, so I won't say anything about it right now. But the first one was kind of a fly-by-night record with a chorus in Virginia. And what I learned from that project was if you ever want to lose any Christmas spirit you have, um, <laughs> listen to 22 takes of Silent Night on a hot August Saturday. <laughs> Um, the, the second project, I'm much happier with, is a flute and harp record, and the first chamber music record I ever worked on, and uh, it taught me that there is no hell for audio engineers. Um, there is only heaven, but the audio engineers who are condemned to perdition have to go to heaven and record harps for all eternity. <laughs> um, so I may, if you know, things drag a little bit, I may have to ask them, how do you record a harp? Because I still don't really know. Um, I do. Oh, good. <laughs> That's why you're here. <laughs> so um, rather than do the kind of the standard panel thing of walking through a long bio that you can read in the program, I just thought we'd talk a little bit with Max and Dohong at first about their backgrounds and how they got to be where they are, which is at the top, the absolute top of their profession, producing classical recordings. Uh, when, and, you know, sure, there are Grammy Awards, but what there is more than that is the respect of the musicians and the music lovers who hear the recordings, which are exquisite. And we're going to hear some of them today. Um, Max was telling me over lunch uh, a story about working, a number of stories about working with a pianist you may have heard of, Arthur Rubinstein, um, as his exclusive producer at RCA. In the 50s, was it kind of your introduction, your main introduction to the business, right? Even though you yeah, decided, right. you mentioned you decided very young this is something you wanted I to wanted do. I wanted to be a recording producer since I was 14 years old because I really didn't want to work for a living. I just wanted to have fun. And of course, I never thought I could do that, but I did. <laughs> have fun? Have fun, yeah. Good, good, It's good. not work. It's, it's a musician, you know, having a great time doing what a musician does. Not that it's not work, right. but it's not a job. I don't think of it as a job. Now, my, I was trying to think of how to describe to the audience what a music, what, a, what a record producer does. And the simplest thing I could come up with, and you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, is that uh, it's basically you're in control of everything that's on the tape that isn't playing or conducting or singing, right? That basically you have final responsibility to make sure everything gets on there and is right. Is that about it? Well, it's a little more complicated than, than that. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you're the person in the room with maybe a, a young musician or maybe Arthur Rubinstein or maybe George Schulte in the Chicago Symphony. It's your job, if they're making a television show or a recording, to make them feel comfortable. Because when they're in front of 3,000 people, which is how they spend their lives, that's one thing, and they feed off the audience. Now, they're sitting in an empty room or an empty concert hall with, I hope, not too many microphones around in front of them. And the audience is me and a couple technicians and maybe you know, a friend who's out there. That's a rather phony kind of feeling. So I have to become their audience and their uh, you know, chief cheerleader. And the first thing I have to do, and, and all of this, of course, applies exactly to Do Hong, I assume. Uh, in fact, I know. Um, <laughs> if we don't get to the session knowing the music essentially as well as the people we're recording that music with, then we're absolutely of no use to them because um, Mr. Rubenstein once told me that he had not such a great relationship with a couple other producers who would say to him, and he would say, how is Dot, he would say, because he couldn't say TH, how is Dot, he would say. And they would say, oh, wonderful, Mr. Rubenstein, perfect, perfect. And he said, what that meant to me was they just wanted to go and have martinis, and they would tell me everything was good. And he said, with you, I know if you like it or don't like it, and I know if I like it or don't like it, and we keep on working till we have something that's really good, whether it takes two hours or, or eight hours. And uh, the musicians have to have confidence in you as a musician, and you have to really be able to hear on their level, because again, otherwise, you're of no use to them. If you can't hear that the string um, ensemble is out of tune or not together, which is really all string players care about. Right, Dahan? 
<laughs> <laughs> of course they care about the music, but when it comes to the editing, it's this in tune, is this the guitar, and this goes on forever. Fortunately, pianists, pianists are not like that. They have their own set of problems. But, <laughs> but that's not one of them. <laughs> now, it's peculiar to that. Now, as, a, as a young man, you talk about having the respect of the artists you're working with. You're a very young man working with Arthur Rubenstein. You, right. had, you had musical training? Mm -hmm. Yes, I you know, was schooled as a musician. I was a, a student of a very famous pianist named Edward Steuermann, who happened to be an acquaintance of Arthur Rubenstein. And very briefly, I started, the first time I ever met Mr. Rubenstein, I came to a recording session because I was a young guy doing, being a music editor. I wasn't a producer yet. Uh, I just would go to the sessions because I worked at night. And there was Arthur Rubenstein recording the Chopin scherzos. And I was working on his recording of the Chopin Second Piano Concerto with Alfred Wallenstein. Well, the page turner had to leave, and suddenly there I was, sitting beside the great man. So I remember taking my shoes off, and I remember men mentioning Steuermann, and Rubenstein became my instant friend. In literally in two minutes, he started talking to me about the scherzo, and I remember I was sort of floating about 90 feet above the ceiling of the Manhattan Center where we were recording. It makes it hard to reach the page. That's so. right. Yeah. And, uh, and that was my introduction to him. And unbeknownst to me, by the end of uh, the following year, I would start a 17-year career recording him until he retired. We made 60 LPs together. Television shows, and just so I get this in because you might forget it, it ended up in 1973, he had heard me conduct some things. I conducted the Royal Liverpool Philharmonic Orchestra in the Lind Symphony and the Chopin Second Piano Concerto and the Beethoven Fourth Piano Concerto, and M Mr. Rubenstein was the soloist. So we actually made music together. So that was, by all points, the great musical highlight of my entire life. But don't get the idea he was only working with Rubenstein, too. He was also making the great, uh, the great Boston Symphony recordings with Charles Munch. And, and I was Munch's producer. I was Van Cliburn's producer. I brought the Groenary Quartet and Peter Sarkin to the label. Uh, I re recorded Henrik Schering, Pierre Fournier, blah, 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 the Philadelphia Orchestra for four years. And now, now around Then the I left because right. I had to get this in because okay. once the hung starts talking, I'm not going to be able to say a word. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've been a freelancer now since 1974, recording little people like Richard Good, who I've recorded for 26 years now, I think. Richard Stoltzman, I think I've recorded for 27 years, off and on. I've been Don Upshaw's producer. I made the or original recordings, and still, although Del Hung is now starting to beat me, <laughs> probably 65% of the re recordings that the Emerson Quartet ever made, because I started them out as their recording producer. And so I've had, I've had a lovely time doing, recording some of the really great, great artists in the world. Now, we discovered over lunch that they're connected uh, musically. Their, their connection, uh, they have a professional connection now, of course, and the, uh, the Shostakovich string quartets that we'll hear a little bit of later, uh, they share production credits on, having produced different recordings in the series. And we share Grammys, too. Two Absolutely. Of these, right. okay. and, um, <laughs> but it's a recording of the 1812 Overture that we discovered actually linked them much farther back than either of them knew. Now this for sure, yeah. Th th this was a significant date for you, it right? Was with uh, eighteen twelve overture with Ormandy, right? I, <laughs> I was on I went on a little conducting tour, and of course I was working as a producer at at RCA, and uh, I was suddenly given the Philadelphia Orchestra as my one of my artists, and so I gave up three concerts as a conductor, but I thought it was a pretty good choice, really, right. <laughs> and. The first recording session I had with Ormandy, we didn't start out with something simple and get some balances. We were recording the 1812 Overture in, the, in an arrangement with chorus at the end. And um, the chorus had to go home. So we start the whole thing. We were going to add electronic cannons afterwards. So the cannons weren't there, but we had the whole orchestra and the battery of percussion and about a hundred voice chorus. And that's how we started the session, our first recording together. So, um, and the recording came out pretty well. And then we discovered at lunch that... Well, De Hong owned this recording. Yeah, it just so happened that the Philadelphia Orchestra visited China in 1971, follow, immediately following uh, President Richard Nixon's uh, visit to China. They, they opened a relationship and then the orchestra went there. And at that time, they 
just produced the whole stack of records with uh, uh, Max, and they left a lot of those records in China. And I somehow I, I was lucky enough to put my hands on uh, one of those records, and one of them happened to be uh, the 1812 Overture records. I thought it was very neat, you know, so electronic canon and whatnot. So. <laughs> and I just discovered this 15 minutes ago over lunch that Dohang, when he was 11 years old, had this. Did they have the fold-out cover with the hole in the middle and all of that stuff oh, yeah, in the American? Yeah, yeah this right. four-track. That's three, right, yeah, yeah. yeah. CD now, and now I was an 11-year-old because listening to the 1812 Overture, not this particular recording, but five other ones because my father was obsessed with the 1812 Overture, <laughs> which uh, caused a teacher of mine to say, likes the big guns, does he? <laughs> um, <laughs> but Member of the NRA? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully, no. Um, but... I, you know, I had a royal blue plastic GE stereo with little cube speakers, and, uh, and I could turn it on and turn it off. And if I wanted a, a patch cord for something, if I wanted to play radio at home, I would go to the Radio Shack and buy the cord. I was, you know, dorky, but somewhat average for an 11-year-old. Now, De Hong is living in China during the Cultural Revolution, where records are, are, are clandestine, records are contraband, are being passed around as a stereo gear. Yeah, it, it's pretty difficult. I started playing the violin when I was very young, when I was very young, I was two and a half years old. I, both my parents were musicians. My father is a violinist. And uh, so, so he, you know, I, I picked the violin when I was very young. And, and he instead of giving me lessons when I was six years old. And he spent four hours with me every day. Now, unfortunately, at that time, 1966, uh, the Cultural Revolution came. And uh, everything was banned, everything was shut down, and my father lost his job as a, uh, as a principal of the second violin section of the Shanghai Symphony Orchestra. And he was, was, was forced to work in the uh, recycling manufacture. And um, uh, our possessions were taken away, and, and uh, we couldn't play any Western music. Uh, so it, at that point, but the only thing, you know, my father is a relatively simple man, and the only thing he could sort of teach me is to play the violin, and he's a true musician. And, uh, and also, it's, it's a way of keeping, you know, one's kids out of trouble, because you don't want them to play outside, you know. It, it's not exactly a happy time at, 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 at the moment. And uh, so, so we had the windows all closed and the curtain all drawn. And, and I was, the only thing I was allowed to play essentially is all scales and the finger exercises and the bowling exercises. You can't play any tunes because, you know, it's something that's forbidden. And, and then now, uh, at that point also, besides the education aspect, it, and the Western music, it, everything Western is shut down and you, there's no concert you can go. There's no record you can, can hear. Uh, all the records were destroyed. Well, you know, our records were searched and, and they were taken away and destroyed. We had no, nothing left over. And, and now, being musicians, both my parents, they were sort of plugged into their own circle of friends who had some uh, records survived the Cultural Revolution. And, and they were being circulated underground and, and, you know, amongst all these musicians. And, and you have to be very secretive. And then you, you know, my parents would were able to borrow them for overnight, and then we'll listen to it, and then you have to return the next day. Now, uh, but you know, I I I started violin, and I love the music, and um, I want to hear the, those records more than once. So the only way I can do this, my father borrowed and and used all his savings and and managed to buy me a used real to, to real to real recorder. It's a German telefunken brand, I remember that. I was, I was only 11 years old. And, and uh, that, that recorder probably was smuggled in to China and whatnot. I, I don't know where it came from, but uh, anyway, so, so being a mechanical device, uh, real to real recorder is, it, it, after you use it for extensive amount of a time, it starts to develop problem, mechanical, electronic, and whatnot. So uh, then I was out of my recorder, my dear recorder. I was spending so much time with. And so I, I was determined to fix it. Now, um, at that point, because cultural revolution was still going on, you don't want, really want to have people fix it. Because essentially, you're giving away, you have that thing. You know, it's, it's, it's a total giveaway. And not, to, not to mention the fact that nobody really knew how to fix that thing anyway, because it was imported goods. And, and China at that point was so backwards. Um, nothing was, you know, it was, it was, there's no information available. There certainly was no internet at that point. Uh, so so I, I, at the, I was determined I, I have to have my music. So I, I tried to learn how to fix that thing. 
And, and uh, you know, at that point, there's no parts you can buy to replace it. So, uh, or a manual. A manual, and that matter. Yeah, so I had to reverse engineer in the whole thing. Yeah, in Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> So you, you know, take that thing apart very slowly, try to... Which is actually easier than learning German and getting an annual anyway. <laughs> so. Right. So, so I, I did the reverse engineering, trace the circuitry, and then figure out what, you know, what part is doing what job. And then the ball bearing would wear out, so I, I would find a chunk of a metal and start to machine my own ball bearings. At the bearings. age of 11, I will remind yeah. you. No. And, Machining and, his own ball bearings <laughs> at 11. Just ponder this for a moment. He's reverse engineered a Telefunken recorder. And, okay, so you got the ball bearings. What else would break down? Then, then the transformer blew up. And, and so, so I, had, you know, I had to dewind the transformer. You know, it's essentially a, 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 a chunk of a metal with a, with a magnetic wire to wind down it. And so I dewind the, the, the coil so I realized it got broken, but I have no way of getting wires, you know, the magnetic wire to replace it with. So, but what I did find, it was, it was a broken motor. And I decoiled that motor and used that wire to, to fix my transformer. So I, I patched up the, the recorder pretty extensively. And, and by the time I left China, I, the recorder didn't really quite look the way it's supposed to anymore. <laughs> no, at 11, I, I could barely run a light bright at 11. You know. Well, when, when, you, when you have to do something, you, you become rather resourceful. Um, that sort of if started you're really, me. really, really smart. Right. <laughs> that, oh, that too. <laughs> So that sort of launched my recording career in a sense because you know I, I, at that point I knew how to fix a recorder and I knew how to splice recordings because the, the real to, to real tape that I was able to get to record these things are very scarce. You don't want to waste any of that stuff. So some, you know you have to reuse them, recycle them, and you have to splice them. One so you know you learn how to splice tapes in that way, and and also start to sort of record myself. Uh, so that's sort of launched my recording interest. Um, then then I, uh, it, I, when I, when I came to this country and was studying uh, here, uh, it, it sort of, people knew, I, my, my colleagues, my schoolmates, they all knew that I was interested in recording uh, uh, whatnot, electronics. So when they needed to make a uh, uh, audition tape, you know, students, musicians, would say, so will you be able to do that? I said, yeah, sure, we'll, we'll do something. So I, I was doing it. That's sort of, I got to be known as, as someone who can do recordings. But this is, let me also interject, also while training as a violinist at Curtis and then at Juilliard. Right. And, and preparing for a career as a player. Galami and then Dorothy DeLay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, them. <laughs> other, yeah. other inferior <laughs> beginning professors. So, after being discovered by Joseph Silverstein, mm -hmm. then the concertmaster of the Boston Symphony on tour. Uh, yeah. during it's, a visit to the Shanghai Conservatory. It's a pretty interesting story. It, it, also in, in the 70s, uh, Boston Symphony Orchestra went to, went to visit China. Now all that all happened after the Cultural Revolution already had ended, and I was one of a very lucky few to be, uh, uh, to be uh, 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 enrolled in Shanghai Conservatory. And they, they came, uh, the orchestra came, and they decided to have the orchestra visit Shanghai Conservatory and to sort of showcase what communist, you know, country can do. So, so the school called me up and one day said, hey, come here, we, we want you to uh, pretend you're practicing in the studio. <laughs> so, so the whole barrage of people came and, and uh, Mr. Silverstein was, you know, he was the concert master, he was leading the way and knocking on the studio one door after another and, and I was obviously practicing there. And so, so he came in and, and we, I played for him and we exchanged some, uh, some words. I didn't speak much of English then, but we had the uh, translators. But he also showed me his Guarneri's violin. That was really nice. So that's my, <laughs> my first time to play a, a real Guarneri's violin. It was, it was wonderful. And uh, uh, it, it luckily, at, at that point, uh, because it, it was so early on of, of opening up the China, when Boston would visit, for Boston Symphony also would visit China, uh, they brought on a barrage of reporters, news in news people, and and uh, uh, one of a Time magazine reporter uh, had written up a major article uh, in the Time magazine, 1973 or oh, 1979. I'm sorry, at that point, and uh, my name was mentioned as one of only students that played for the orchestra, and you know, and that's how I sort of lead into. How I came here, and and uh, to make a long story short, um, I, uh, John Delancey, he was the uh, 
director of a Kurdish uh, Institute of Music, uh, when he when he had uh, received my application to come to to the uh, uh, wanted to wanted to come to study at Kurdish. The, current, the school policy is always you have to audition in person, obviously. And but at that point, I, I was not able to come to the United States or audition just to uh, to do that. But because the, the I was mentioned in the article and I played for Silverstein, and they were good friends, and they actually both of them went to Curtis together. They were buddies, and so he John Delancey so called him up and then and this is, said, "What do you think about this kid?" And uh, so Silverstein, I mean, Silverstein said, yeah, take him. So one day I was in China and, I, and, and door knocked and the postman came, delivered a, a, a telegram and opened up. It, it, it says, following the recommendation of Mr. S uh, Joseph Silverstein, we accept you as a full scholarship, so full scholarship student studying with the Columbia at the Curtis Institute. Would you respond? It's like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> That's essentially how I came to this country. And uh, uh, four years later, I spent two more years uh, at the Juilliard, uh, studying with Miss Delay. Um, so I, and after that, I, I launched a uh, solo career uh, playing the violin. And uh, uh, that sort of leads into my recording thing. Uh, what happened is I, I started touring as a soloist, but I quickly realized that I really was not interested in the traveling aspects of, of the solo career uh, because you, you literally have to live with a suitcase a three quarter times of your, your life essentially uh, traveling from city to city playing city to city 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 it goes on and on you're spending nine ten months a year on the road and uh, it's just very tiring and, and uh, I mean I, I love playing on the stage it, it's, it's really glorious when you play in front of thousands of people and so for, for the half hour you play a concerto or whatnot, it, it's fantastic, it's such a high. But then what happens next 23 and a half hours? I mean, it's, it's, it's just, it's not something for me, I, I decided. I mean, not that I'm giving up the violin, I, mean, I still play, I still give concerts. Uh, but at least I decided not to travel uh, that much. Um, then opportunity came and, and the colleagues, uh, Eugene Drucker actually, right. Uh, he's the, of the Emerson uh, Quartet. Uh, of the Emerson right. Quartet. He decided to make a, uh, uh, a CD set of a Bach solo partitas and sonatas. And uh, uh, he says he knew, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a violinist. I knew those pieces, obviously. You, you sort of have to have a producer who knows all that stuff in order to do that thing, to put together. So he asked me whether I would do it for him. I said, well, we'll try. That sort of officially launched my recording business. I mean, that was good to... Uh, 15 years ago? Yeah. Yeah. That's, well, yeah. Let's, let's talk about, I think this is a good, since you know, you're being asked to produce a record at this point in the story, let's talk about how a record actually gets made. Um, the producer, I mean, I guess from your experience working at a label, was the A&R, meaning artist and repertoire work, and uh, was the music generally chosen already? Did you participate in the process of what was going to be on the album, or did your work it begin would, at the session? It would, it would depend. Um, Mr. Rubenstein could record anything he wanted to, because his, I remember he told me somewhat modestly that the, uh, the royalties he earned every year were $250,000 a year in royalties. <laughs> now, these are royalties in the, in the money of the 1960s. And he was really the most famous pianist in the world. Sure. Uh, you know, despite, you, know, you could say, well, Horowitz was also very famous when he felt like playing, but Rubinstein was out there in the trenches. Right playing all the time and um, quite dramatic contrast between those two great personalities. So he could record what he wanted to. As far as Ormandy was concerned, uh, the merchandising department would help so he could record the Shostakovich's 14th and 15th symphonies, but he would also make a recording called Love Story, which is <coughs> you know, based on the movie track and have someone tell him the tempos that these pieces are supposed to go. And he was a good sport, and he did that sort of thing. Right. <coughs> Most conductors wouldn't do that, but he had been in, um, in the Roxy Theater as the concertmaster when he was a young kid coming over you know, sure. from Hungary. So he would do that. And as far as the Guarneri Quartet, we pretty much, the quartet and I decided what we wanted to record, and we had the Beethoven Quartets to go through, and I think Arthur Rubinstein wanted to play, so that wasn't a very difficult decision to make either. Uh, but it was a collaboration between 
the head of the department if that person happened to know very much about music, which was not always the case, right. but sometimes it was. Uh, when you're working with artists at the level of the RCA Victor Red Seal um, roster, you're not very often dictating to them. I mean, when Peter Serkin, I brought Peter to the label when he was 17 years old and his first recordings were the Goldberg Variations and the great G Major Schubert Sonata and nobody told Peter what to record. So, you know, within reason, right. uh, the great artists can pretty much record what they want to, especially in that era where it wasn't quite so uh, you know, merchandise driven. Right. Now I've gone down this dusty road way away from the question. No, no, no. I was, I was say let's just, let's just pick let's just, uh, a hypothetical situation. Let's say you're recording um, an orchestra, uh, you know, a major orchestra and a, right. a major conductor in say, two Beethoven symphonies. Let's say right. okay. Beethoven fourth, Beethoven fifth. All right. What for each of you? Where, what happens now? The dates have been set because right. the orchestra generally controls the dates the orchestra is available, right. Right. and when the conductor can jet in for his week with the orchestra, you know, um, or if he's a permanent conductor, right. His two weeks that year. Yeah. Um, usually it's not with guest <laughs> conductors. Right. Recordings are usually made with the music director of the orchestra. True. So the, the dates have been set. Right. What do you do now? What's your job? Well, my job is first to learn the piece almost as well as a conductor because otherwise I'm worthless to him if I just tell him that that's great. And I fail to notice that maybe someone in the, you know, the third horn didn't happen to play then or the violins are really out of tune in this passage or this is really not together. Uh, I have to know that piece, I can't say as well as the conductor because that's silly, but I have to know it very, very well. And I have to sit there and with the score and essentially guide the conductor you know, through the performance, and not guide him through the performance, that's the wrong thing to say. Wow. The thing is, they make a first... <laughs> Don't be too modest. <laughs> <laughs> Some of the younger people I will guide through the performance. That's the extreme opposite. <laughs> but uh, you make a take of a movement of a symphony, and the conductor comes in and listens to it, and, um, and they d decide if... Is there a problem with any of the balances, or do they not like their tempo? And then they go out and usually will play it again. With Ormandy, it was a little different. He played the piece from beginning to end with little stops for things that went wrong. And as far as he was concerned, that was the recording. Not probably the ideal way to do it, but he was a maniac for you know using economy. I once recorded 52 minutes of music in a two-hour session with him. Three-hour session with, a, with an hour off, and there were seven separate pieces. <laughs> that was the record. 52 minutes of finished music. That's a lot. Right. That's a lot. So yeah, Armandy just sort of pushed yeah. the button of go to the Rolls Royce of the Philadelphia Orchestra, and they played, and he came in and listened, and we all went home. Right. That's uh, very different. That was a rather, yeah. very <laughs> rather extreme way of doing yeah, it, as, a, as opposed to, say, recording a string quartet movement 17 times in a row and splicing it right. for 4,000 splices yeah, and yeah. making it sound like they can play like that. <laughs> <laughs> now, not, 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 we're not talking about any quartet in particular. Let's, let's, be, let's be serious about that. Of course that. not. Um, but so you generally, when you're doing this, you're in the booth, in the right. temporary control room. It could be a right. green room at an orchestra hall. It could right. be you know, a, a, a green room filled with carpets and, and padding and, and all sorts of gear that's been trucked in for the occasion. Yeah. It could be somewhere backstage. It could be in the basement. Wherever. It could be in a truck. It could, yeah. it could be an, right. or a remote, remote truck. truck. The kinds yeah. of remote trucks that go out to, you see parked outside of arenas for sports events, they have the same things for sound. Right. Um, but you are generally there working, you have the score, and right. you have a, a way of communicating with the conductor. Right, I have a, a know, full phone or a talk back. Or television something. set and a microphone and a, and a telephone. Usually with a conductor you talk over the telephone, you don't Be sort yell of out your comments in yeah. front of the whole orchestra. Right, so you and the conductor could have a private conversation. Right. Right. Um, and you're working with an engineer who's actually pushing all the faders and... and well, sitting. hopefully they're not pushing the faders. Right, right, sorry. We hope. It's set and it's done. It's done. Well, you got the balance in the beginning, and if it's it, the sort of thing that you've done many, many times, like I have a whole chart of, a whole folder of microphone setups, and even with the, you know, with the balance between the microphones. Right. And if I do a piano recording, I put that setup up, and usually it's in the American Academy of Arts and Letters. So I even have a small little, hall in New York. Right. Yeah, beautiful, small hall that maybe would seat eight, nine hundred people. And that's the hall in, I, in which I made my very first recording with Arthur Rubenstein oh. in 1959, and where Don I was and I still yet. record. That's yeah. right. I was not even born. Yet. 
<laughs> so I put up the microphones for the piano set up, and, if, and then maybe I'll move it two or three inches or lower the two or three inches, and I have the same thing for, I have the same thing for harp. Ah, with Mariko okay. Anraku, the great <laughs> young harpist of the right. Met Pot in the, the Met Orchestra. And I have setups for all of these things that carefully evolved over the years. That doesn't mean that uh, and I'm rigidly locked into these things because I'm constantly tinkering with them, but they're the, really the result of a long amount of experience. Of, so I start with a, a known factor. I don't just say, right. oh, where did I put the mics last time? Oh, I think it was over here. Right. I measure it with the plumb bob, and it's within a sixteenth of an inch of where it was the last time. Right. Then the weather might be different, and so you move the mics back a little bit, or it might be more humid, or you, know, right. you tinker with it. Now, you will be doing that. You may be working with an engineer. <laughs> DeHong serves as his own engineer. Uh, if you, he's been recording all. One of the things that that's makes that's not quite right. Well, true. Right. Well, <laughs> okay, but uh, I'm not interrupting you. Oh no, no, no. But <laughs> my recording is say produced and engineered by okay. me. Okay, right. <laughs> and well, DeHong is an actual electrical genius. I don't know one thing about electronics. <laughs> But I do know what kind of microphones I like, and I do know what kind of hall I want to record in, which is, by, by the way, 80% the of the success of any recording is the location in which it's recorded. Mm -hmm. And if you're not a total idiot and can make a decent sounding recording, it'll be fine. If you're in a bad hall, I don't care if you're even, you know, Dong C2 or Max Wilcox, you can't make it sound good because it's not physically possible to make it sound good. Um, but my recordings say engineered by me because I really do the placement of the mics and get the approval of the artists, usually people I've worked with you know, for a long, long time, so it's not a big deal. Or if they're really new, they don't dare say anything to me. So <laughs> <laughs> they're sort of stuck with it, you know. But it's so fantastic that why, you know, it's just a thrill to them. Right. They have sound like that. You know? Sure. <laughs> well, <laughs> and I tell them that that's what they're supposed to think before they even hear it. <laughs> I think Max so, would have plays it for them. Right, yeah. <laughs> Eliminate the middleman. So, okay, so when I say I work with, I work with someone who operates the tape machines. Okay. But I'm the total, absolute dictator of what it sounds like. Right, so you have essentially a second, then. Yeah. yeah. So if it sounds lousy, that's my fault. If it sounds good, I will t modestly take credit no. for it. <laughs> oh, the word modestly probably doesn't apply. <laughs> <laughs> now, was I'm sorry. I no, 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 no. <laughs> what I was say is one of the reasons it's such a pleasure to come work here at uh, Summerfest is we know that all the music is going to be recorded well. De Hong is actually here. Um, how do I? How do I? Stress this. Um, Jimmy Lin, the, mu the artistic director, Sherling Lin, said uh, that he considers De Hong part of the musical staff of the festival. De Hong records all the concerts up in the Sherwood Auditorium and, and makes them sound great. If you go up in the booth, there's a lot of gear that he brought with him. And the fact that his speakers, his monitors say C2 on them isn't a coincidence. He didn't move to America and find that someone else named C2 was making speakers. He built them himself. <laughs> um, the, he uses a little, uh, there's a little bit of artificial reverb to make the sound sound a little, you give a little bit of echo, a little bit of bloom to the sound because Sherwood's a very dry hall. A lot of it. A lot. I was trying to it's soft pedal. It's a secret. Pedal. It's a secret. Don't tell anybody, but it's a lot of it. So, <laughs> nobody here in this room will repeat this. Right. No, yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. It won't go it's anywhere in public. And the cameras so. are off at this point. That's true. So. <laughs> so, we were up, a couple of the MTR engineers and I were up in the booth uh, preparing for our time here, and I asked about the, or somebody asked about the reverb unit, he said, what do you use? And DeHong mentioned a manufacturer. And we said, well, where is it? And he said, well, I took apart the mixing board and built it in, which, to which one of our people said, oh, well, I guess that violates the warranty now, doesn't it? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> hey, um, you grew up in China. Nothing comes with warranty. Right. You're lucky enough to have that thing in your hand. What warranty? DeHong <laughs> reveals everything. Right. doesn't make any difference what it says on the label. So, so how do you... Oh, how much time do you spend doing that? I mean, how important is that gear that you work on yourself? Well, I mean, to, to, to me, it means a lot. It, it, it's essentially when you sort of get to know what electronic does, and then you do a lot of different electronics, you work on a lot of different, you start to correlate as what I measure on the bench versus what actually sounds. Now, I got to a point that, you know, I, obviously, like being a musician, I know what I want to hear. And, and, uh, and then I, I sort of correlate what I have to do in the electronic end in order to get to the sound that I'm really looking for. So that's the main reason, actually, for me, uh, besides the, the economical reasons, uh, it, it, that for me to build all my own uh, equipment. 
uh, simply because uh, to me that's sort of a, a much more direct way of getting the sound I wanted. And, and I don't have to be dictated by any manufacturer, you know, any other engineer telling me, hey, that's the way it's supposed to sound. No, I know what a violin should sound because I played that thing. And uh, so I, I won't stop until I get the sound that, that, that I know it's supposed right. to be, and then I will do it. I would, I would go, any, go through any lane. Um, you know, I, I, would, I would take the microphone apart and then put my own electronics in there, and, and I would build my own board, you know, build my own speakers, my own amplifier. Um, build my own cables, and whatever right. it takes, just to get the sound I want. And the computers as well, right? <laughs> and, no, no, I'm, I'm dead serious about that. Haven't you also re-engineered some of the hard drives that you, you've done? Yeah, I mean, I, I have to do certain certain things to, to, I mean, a lot of that stuff it does is for, for road-worthy, I mean, when I travel so much, and a lot of equipment, because uh, I own all the equipment, and I have to ship all my equipment. I'm, I'm more or less like what they call a one-man band. A one-man right? band, right. right. So, so all the equipment have, you know, have to be flown there uh, beforehand, and I have to make sure that thing gets there safe and uh, operational, and and so I, I have to do whatever you know, it, it make sure that thing will stick essentially. Right. Yeah, and otherwise I can't recover. And when you're dealing with some very uh, uh, high budget project, when you when I record the orchestra, you know, I I, went, I flew to Taiwan, recorded the uh, Taipei Symphony Orchestra there. Uh, I flew all the big cases cases of of uh, gear and. Uh, uh, you know, it's not very easy to replace all that stuff. I mean, once you there, you find out it doesn't work. So I had to do a lot of, of uh, uh, re-engineering, so to speak, to make sure all that stuff will survive. Right. Yeah. Um, so. So once you're set up, once everything is ready to go, um, orchestra's on stage, conductors come out of the come out of the green room, walking toward the podium. You've got all your gear up. It's all powered up. The tapes are ready to roll. The, the, the session begins. Mm -hmm. The session begins. Now, right. your role in the session. Uh, you, you, you announce, you know, the, the orchestra may not hear you say anything during the whole session, but well, take one. Take yeah, one. Yeah, yeah you, you do the take you, one. They hear, they hear you slate. And you flick on the, the green or green light or, or red light, whatever, right. whichever color you want. And, and uh, so in the starts, and then, you, and then I, I obviously, again, it's just like Max said, I have a whole score in front of me. And hopefully with the same score as what the conductor's using in the whole orchestra. You have to be on the same edition, at least, because different right. editions have very, very big conflicts. Uh, uh, there's a lot of discrepancies in different editions. And some editor decided to, to put in some sort of expression mark here, or to change the dynamic marking, or even change the tempo marking, me uh, metronomic marking. All that stuff had to be all worked out way before you start the whole session. And, and to, you know, what I prefer to do is always go back to what they call the text. Uh, music, meaning that something uh, essentially is more or less of a, of a direct copy of an of a original score. Uh, uh, so you, you, you have you know, no other sort of minds that involved in that. You, you just stick to what composers really wanted to, and you start out from there. Now, if you want to interpret uh, on your own, then that's fine, but at least you, know, you, you go close to the source. They really go to the source, and that's how you start. And now I will, I will be looking at the score, and we'll, we'll stop playing the thing. And, and so let's call it take one, and the, and the conductor will, will do all the performer will do take one. And I'll be looking at the score and listen to it. Um, something goes, goes well, great. If something doesn't go well at a particular point, one note or one chord or one measure, whatnot, you, you start making notations on the score. Something here didn't really go right. Uh, then after one take, we'll listen to it and we'll discuss about it. Okay, something is not right. I mean, most of the musicians, very good musicians, will know something didn't go up, they'll go right. I mean, they'll know that. So, all right, let's go there and let's do it again, maybe. So we'll do another take and I'll do the same thing on marking. and whatnot. Now, one of the things that I have to be very careful is um, because it involves uh, editing later on, so the tempo has to be consistent between take to takes. Dynamic has to be consistent. Uh, it, because otherwise I can't splice it. What splice really means is essentially that you cut and paste. That's all it is. Uh, it's like a, using a word processor. You know, you, you, you're typing out a letter and then you start moving your text around. I mean, that's what splicing is all about. Meaning that, you know, if I have one take and then that measure didn't go so well, and then yet the second take, the rest of it didn't go too, too great, but that measure was perfect. So you use that. You, know, you just cut it and, and, the, and then paste it in. That's what, you know, in a nutshell, what, what the editing is all about. But, now, but, where, but where can a session, if, it's, if all goes well, if the musicians are playing well, they all agree, okay, there's a horn clam in bar 38, let's fix it. Let's if fix it. Okay, great. What happens, and I'm sure you've had some sessions where things didn't go so well, what happens when you hear things aren't quite as good as they could be, and you may have a bit of a recalcitrant artist on your hands, or, or I mean, it, does, it, does it become a, diff, is it ever difficult 
in relating to the artists to get them to, to give you more or to do something over? I, I, or to I really, I can't really say that I've ever experienced that. Well, no. I, I have. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'd, be, I'd be sure we remain nameless, but I, I actually did a recording for a uh, pianist, and it was slated to do it, and then she sent me all the score and then everything. I, I, I looked at it, and it was fine. So, so we went to the recording session, and we started recording. And uh, 20 minutes into it, we recorded a, a piece that's only two minutes long. It's a slow, easy piece, and it was not happening. And, uh, not uh, happening musically, or she was missing notes, or musically, technically, just nothing was really happening. She right. must have very, very bad day, or she just certainly not up to par. Um, I mean, it, it granted in, in a, you know because we sort of didn't really communicate very well, I suppose, in, in a sense. But uh, it, it, then I realized that something is not happening. So I got to a point uh, after 20 minutes, we sort of struggle, struggle through uh, uh, two minutes worth of, of a music. Uh, that little piece, and I just put my hands in the arm uh, in the air. I said, "You know what? Uh, we should quit because I don't think I can do it. I can't put it together." So I said, "You know, that we should quit this piece. Or we should, we quit, should quit the, the recording session. session. This project wow. completely. We ju I just canned it. I said, let's, let's not do it.' So it has happened because the uh, artist wasn't prepared. Yeah, it was not prepared. Right. So why should we waste the artist's time or, or waste my time? In that case, I'm you know we're That's very right. busy doing recordings. So you know, you, you, and at, frankly, at the point, you know, even I was able to splice it together. Is it going to sound like a hell? So right. why want to waste your time? You know, why would you sort of subject your audience you right. know, to sub, you know, that kind of recording? It's just it's not it's not right. It's, did it's the, not did that project ever get completed with another producer? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Can I mention something here? That sure. of, of course, you know, when you're sitting at a session, especially if it's a string quartet or an orchestra. Yes, you're listening to see if something is not together or not in tune or is the same tempo. But that really is sort of the boilerplate of the whole thing. What you're really trying to do is make sure that there's a great interpretation that's going on. And uh, you can listen to performances by the NBC S Symphony in Toscanini, and there might be a, a couple things out of tune. But it's still the great maestro conducting a great performance if he was, you know, in a relaxed form, then you heard something indescribably beautiful. Uh, and that's, of course, what the listener wants. They don't buy a recording and say, gee, I wonder, if, I wonder if this passage in measure 63 in the first movement is going to be in tune or not. And of course, the advent of digital recording, in a way, has led to a widespread abuse of the ability to paste together a performance. And we're all virtuosos at doing this. And I think we're all of two minds about doing this. Because in a way, uh, even young people, and I've had some young people come in, and they already start talking about how they're going to edit. Uh, and I find this maddening, because it's using the ability to, to edit something, and people can almost feel that they don't have to turn up really, really well prepared to do this. And this has led me, because I'm an egomaniac, to start coaching young people who are usually friends of mine. For instance, now let me use the instance of the St. Lawrence Quartet because I'm sure that they wouldn't mind if I said this. They are a very, very fine quartet. They studied with the Emerson Quartet. They were chosen by EMI to record two Schumann quartets. And they did me the honor of saying, we want to play for you first. And we spent over a period of about four different times, probably 13 hours, uh, working on these quartets together, and I would just say what I had to say uh, about the music, uh, and I'm sort of a little bit scholarly about what I think the style of the music is, and some of the, you know, I'd, I've learned a lot of things as a musician over all of these years. Um, and I've, I do that with, with quite a few people now, it's like the On Trio, the very more and more famous young uh, Korean sister trio, I've become their chamber music coach, uh, which is a really hard gig because they're three of the most beautiful women in the world, but it's, somebody has to do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and of course, since I'm a frustrated conductor, it gives me an outlet to coach people. Uh, and that's fine if I'm a really good musician, and I, I would have to admit I think I am. Uh, <laughs> 
So being a legend in my own mind, <laughs> it doesn't bother me. There will be a rebuttal period. <laughs> later. Yeah, right. <laughs> but we, you know, it's, it's very easy to get into this. Let's make sure it's in tune and together and, you know, and uh, this is that. But what the audience wants to hear is a beautiful performance of a wonderful piece of music in, in a nice situation. And they're not aware of all of the, see, the things that we go through to make that happen. And Dohung and I both have to, in the, in the end, be musicians. Uh, you you can't do the job people. we do essentially without being a musician, and right. not only being a musician, but also I mean, I to, to my thinking, I think you also have to be a good performance performing artist in the sense because you have to That's understand right. the psychics of, of of a performer in on the stage or in front of microphones. You have to understand that. So. You know, often you, you, you record someone and then you, something is not going well, for instance. And uh, you sort of, you have to sort of figure out what to say to the artist. You tell them to say, hey, something didn't go well, let's do it again. If, it may, sometimes you probably, it may not be the very best thing to say to the artist. Mm -hmm. uh, it could be something that, you know, it's, it's psychological. And, and, you know, or sometimes it could be as simple as let's go take a five minute uh, break and then come right. back and yeah. bang, it's on. Always say, let's say, leave that piece to tomorrow, for tomorrow's session. It may work much better instead of sort of trying to beat on dead horse. Right. You know, it, right. it's not happening, don't, don't push it. Uh, but you know, all that stuff, you know, it obviously comes with experience, but also sort of you have to uh, be in their shoes. You know, you, you, at least you, you have to try their shoes. You, you should know what, what they possibly is going through their mind. And, and you, you come up with a, a good sort of lend them a good helping hand and, and the pull the whole project together. Uh, and one thing I, 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 I might say respectfully, Max, yeah. uh, uh, in, in my approach to, to doing the recordings, I sort of try to stay out of uh, the interpretation aspects of, of the performance or the recording aspects of it. Uh, simply because I, I found that uh, you know, if I'm recording a good musician, I have to respect what they have to say. Uh, you know, I would have to assume that, that a good musician or a good group of musicians, they come to be prepared to do a recording, I have to assume they are well prepared and that they know what they want. Uh, so, you know, I try to stay out of it, unless something really drastic is wrong with it. I mean, you know, you, you're taking a wrong tempo, I mean, completely wrong, it's not what says on the score, but for most part, I try to sort of uh, uh, let the musicians do what they want because, after all, it is their performance. Um, you know, I mean, yeah, I mean, they, they, I mean, then you, you might argue what's wrong with coaching them. Yeah, but, but uh, I, if, if a musician is that level, it's already making a record to be sort of etched in, in the history, uh, I don't think I, I should be interfering with what they have to say. I let them say it. And, and I will sort of essentially give them the microphone and, and uh, make sure the speaker's working and let them say what they have to say. And, and obviously, you know, as I said, there's something, if it really doesn't go well, I mean, we'll, we'll try to work a way out. Uh, but that's sort of my, my thinking. Um, I mean, f the reason I say that is because, frankly, uh, when I record myself, or when I'm in the, in the, in the uh, quartet playing something, when that, I don't want people to tell me what to do. I mean, that's why I decided to do recording producing. I don't want people to tell me what to do. I mean, look, if, if, I, it, you know, if I come to play today, I really know what I want to do. I mean, that's what I have to say. So I'll say it. And, and likewise, I respect, I give the same respect to other musicians. If they have the ready to say something, I'll let them say it. Can and I, I have, have a rebuttal say. here? Sure. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think the difference is, respectfully again, <laughs> When you've recorded someone like Richard Stolzman for 26 years, and you're good buddies, and you talk about music all the time, or you've recorded someone like Richard Good for a long, long period, and that has not happened to Do Hung yet because he hasn't been around <laughs> doing that long enough. You build up a kind of rapport. Certainly, I'm not taking a stranger off the, the stage, and I'm not in any way disagreeing with mm -hmm. your, the fact that you should let people play, but when you've worked with people a long, long time, and can go out and say to, to a violinist, maybe you shouldn't make this particular 
think about not making this particular slide in this right. particular way because that, well, that that happens right. a lot. Right. I mean, that, okay. that happens a lot. I mean, you know, you you catch wrong. But I don't want to be painted here as this Sven Gali who is using these <laughs> poor hapless musicians to <laughs> express myself <laughs> while you're the purest, exactly. what could, and what, you're just leaving them all alone. What, what could possibly have made us think that? I can't uh, imagine. <laughs> Okay, so let's talk about some musicians who need no leading anywhere. The Emerson String Quartet. Now, I'm holding oh, in my yeah. hand something that is <laughs> heavy, but less heavy than a Grammy Award. A Grammy Award, people, is, is a big, substantial thing, by the way. Big chunk yes. of metal. Um, a mastering engineer I worked with on a project we'll listen to in a little bit has one sitting on one of his monitors, and it's satisfying. But this, too, is a big, satisfying mm -hmm. box of stuff. Right. Um, 15, all 15 quartets, plus a couple of small works. Let's have uh, a couple of... Each of you pick out a short example or, or the top of a movement or something. We can listen to a little bit and then let's hear what you hear in this and if there's a story behind it. And then we'll go to some questions after we hear a couple examples of music. I think this is a particularly interesting, is very interesting not problem. very typical <laughs> thing because most recordings by the Emerson Quartet or any other quartet are not a series of live performances. Right. And it is really not the same thing at all even though you can you know, edit back and forth between three performances in a makeup session, it is totally unlike the organic progression of a recording session. So I can relate to these recordings, although Dong did two-thirds of this, uh, but my Grammy is the same size as his. <laughs> <laughs> They did not send me this a, give you the a, horn, a downsized, you know. <laughs> you know, no bass. Not very fair, isn't it? it. <laughs> right, max. You know. so, Would you really hear a studio recording the, instead? Do you want to talk no, about no, the but I'm just, the or? I, I suspect Dohan might agree with me, although I have really mm -hmm. no reason to think he might. But it, it isn't the typical kind of thing, although at the post-production it becomes the same. Right. Yeah, the, yeah, but the, during... Live concerts, you know, they're not coming back and listening to a playback. No, I mean, they, and yeah, I mean, okay. yes, right. sir. No, we, did, right. we actually they, they did come back after we, we actually had the four concerts. You know, either a dry concert, meaning that right. run through concert, a student concert had only the uh, audience sure. for the students, or the real concert where you know we both the, did the same thing. Yeah. and they heard playback. Yeah, they heard they, all the playback yeah, after every performance. Right. I mean, they knew. You know, they were very careful with with things like that, and yes. and uh, just make sure that <clears throat> every concert take. Uh, can be used in, in the uh, post-production because, you know, as I was mentioned before, if the tempo is drastically different, we can't use that. I mean, you know, so the, the stuff like that, you, you have to be really careful. Obviously, you know, Emerson Quartet, they are so experienced in recording, they know um, what not to do. I mean, not to mention what they know exactly what to do, but they also know what not to do. So that's, right. you know, major help. Right. I mean, you know. Maybe we should hear a little bit of this instead. Sure. Right. Can we do this? Sure, no, we can not? do this. Oh, no, no, and the thing is, if you came to any of our houses, this is what this would be like, you know, except with beer, you know. Um, See, I have to explain that this project was started by Emerson's. DG and by Allison and Ames and by me, and we went out to Aspen. And way back in 1994, was it? Yeah. And we recorded quartets 11 through 15. 15. And then the project sort of got put, put aside. aside, and then Deutsche Gramophone ran out of money, so they had to settle on Dohong to finish this whole project. I, 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 I work for nothing, you, you realize that, right? I mean, I mean that, that's why I'm in La Jolla, working with the festival. I mean, Thank you know. goodness, <laughs> yeah. he's almost as good as I am, and then everything sounds the same. I knew this would devolve. And it's, it's for okay. free. Okay, let's, let's, pick, let's pick, a, pick a movement. Pick a movement of a, of a quartet. You one go one ahead, of Dohong. It was so long ago, I don't remember. Forget those late quartets. It doesn't really matter. The they, top they, of the third. They, they, the top of the first. The top of the just, just what about something through 11 through 12, 15? Those are my recordings. <laughs> Sorry, you've already no. lost the privilege for bad behavior. <laughs> You're out of here. Oh, darn. Oh, well. This, this is like I being the quiz master on my word or something. <laughs> <laughs> Half a mock for the Hong Si, too. No, no, aren't you really sorry? You, okay, you decided yeah, to do these things? Yeah, <laughs> and it's recorded on TV forever. Okay, here we go. This is the top of the very first quartet.
I, for one, could sit here all day and listen yeah. to this. Um, I, as I'm going to invoke chair privilege, and uh, <laughs> this is a new recording from NPR Classics, Joanne Folletta conducting the Virginia Symphony. Um, thanks, guys, really. Um, it's three works for children, um, the Benjamin Britten Young Person's Guide to the Orchestra, uh, narrated by Fred Child, who was just here, the host of PT, Scott Simon, Nina Totenberg, Bob Edwards, and Leanne Hansen, all hosts of various NPR programs. Uh, Camille Sanson's Carnival of the Animals with the Peter Schickley narration, read by Weekend All Things Considered host uh, Lisa Simeone, and an ensemble including Andre Michel Schub, who was just here, and the cellist Nathaniel Rosen. But what, I, what I'm going to play a couple minutes of for you uh, is called Peter and the Wolf, A Special Report. Um, I produced the music, I wrote the text, and uh, here's what it sounds like. Okay. <laughs> we came upon oh, a little boy in a tree, you. this Peter. He had captured the wolf with nothing but a rope and a small bird. It was incredible. A hunter in northern Virginia talking about a little boy who fought a wild animal <laughs> and made a gift to the nation. For Thursday, April 23rd, it's all things considered. <laughs> I'm Linda Wertheimer. And I'm Robert Siegel. Earlier today in a meadow just outside the Washington Beltway, a third grader named Peter outsmarted a wolf. Now the animal is sleeping peacefully at the National Zoo. Sylvia Pajoli is at the meadow. Vienna, Virginia is a rural oasis just outside the Washington Beltway, a leafy community that prides itself on law and order. But Peter's story of triumph began in flagrant disobedience. Steve Inskeep has the story of Peter's cat. Mara Lyason recounts the capture. And we attend a parade to the zoo. First, the news. <laughs> From NPR News in Washington. I won't tell Ann Taylor you clapped over her. Donating it to the uh, National Zoo. So thanks very much for coming out this afternoon. And uh, if you have any questions for any of us individually, please come up and see us. Thanks very much. Enjoy the rest of the festival. <laughs>